Ma, no hands. A mall in Thailand installs elevators with foot pedals in lieu of buttons as society moves closer to a touchless world. A nation divided. All 50 states are beginning to reopen. More than 93,000 lives lost. We're taking a closer look at the growing chasm among Americans most affected by the coronavirus and its economic fallout. The devastating numbers in communities of color and what they say about our country's systemic injustice. House Secretary Ben Carson joins us as we dig deeper into what divides us. Breaking news, thousands forced to evacuate their homes after the failure of two dams in Michigan. Rivers crest to historic levels, causing life-threatening conditions. Flood alerts across the eastern half of the country. The deathbed confession. Jane Roe in the Roe v. Wade Supreme Court case, who eventually switched her stance, now says she was paid hundreds of thousands by the anti-abortion you know, I took their money and they put me out in front of the cameras and tell me what to say. And with tourism all but non-existent, many countries' economies are on life support. We'll take you to one of the most sought after destinations in the world while things are quiet, at least for now. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. As the number of cases in New York continue to drop, today Governor Cuomo announced where the new hospitalizations and deaths are originating in minority and low-income neighborhoods across New York City. In the city's low-income communities and communities of color, 27% tested positive for antibodies compared to 19% of the city's general population. So while on its face COVID-19 does not discriminate, the elderly, the poor, and black and brown America are disproportionately suffering. We see that here in this melting pot that is New York City. What we may also be starting to see is COVID's hand in inflaming a vicious cycle of poverty. And that's where we begin tonight with the story of a teenage boy, his single mother, and the school she hoped would change his life. I guess we're gonna put it in the ground. Gardening is said to be a teacher of patience takes time for flowers to push their way up through the dirt. On this day, it's an exercise in optimism. Tomorrow, the dirt and flowers surrounding Zaire Robinson will be at his mother's grave site. For anybody who didn't have the chance to meet your mom, how you would describe her? She was unique. Uh, she was nice and she's very forgiving. She's very respectful. She's very beautiful. And she's also very hardworking. Essence Robinson's hard work was evident nine years ago. With Zaire right by her side, she was the first parent to enroll her child here at what is now Ember Charter School. Talk to me about the first day that you start enrolling students. You're at a church, and who's in there? Yeah, so the very first day, um, don't know who's going to come. No one had heard of us before. And in walks Zaire and his mom, little Zaire. Five years old, uh, come in to register for kindergarten. And so we have to give her the same talk. Listen, it's just registration. There's no guarantee that he's gonna get in. Um, and she's like, I really want him to go to the school. There are no schools around here with teachers who look like him. She came to the lottery a few months later and whose name is called first? Zaire's. Just one month before her baby boy's eighth grade graduation, Essence passed away at home. Zaire, just 14 years old, is the one who found her. I'm really worried about him. You know, I, I think that that when it hits you, um, it's a shock. And he found my niece. He couldn't wake her up, you know, and he was, it was just the two of them at home at that time. You know, the COVID-19 crisis has really layered on top of it, just a gargantuan amount of trauma for our students. You know, more than 50 people have died in our community, many of whom have died at home. So they're not even really being counted in those numbers. So for our students already dealing with the violence and the poverty, now they have to deal with great loss in their lives as well. On the school's website, it says their mission is to ignite, empower, and transform people traditionally labeled at risk. According to the school's founder, Rafiq Kalami Dean, the overwhelming majority of the students have or continue to experience several deeply debilitating traumas, and that was before coronavirus. Everything from sexual abuse and sexual violence, domestic abuse, uh, drug abuse, um, any of the things that you think are connected with generational poverty, multiple tiers of that happen to our students in their homes. And so when they come to us and they go home to those conditions as well, this is a safe place for them. 
This safe space is located in the heart of Bed-Stuy in Brooklyn, the borough that just gained the unfortunate distinction of being home to the zip code with the highest COVID-19 death rate in all of New York City. Kings County, Brooklyn has more coronavirus deaths than any county in the entire country. For over a month was like a ceaseless noise of different ambulances, fire ambulances, police, um, after the other, one after the other, um, just continuous. No place in America has had more people die from COVID-19 than New York City, but the pain has not been shouldered equally. According to the city's health department, while neighborhoods with higher concentrations of black, Latino and low income residents living in housing projects like the Marcy House in bed suffered high death rates, wealthier neighborhoods like Battery Park City in Manhattan saw almost no death. Just as race and income have become strong indicators of who survives and succumbs to coronavirus, race and income are also significant factors in who will thrive academically. Prior to the pandemic, the achievement gap between low income and other children was already reportedly equivalent to at least two years of schooling. People are really enamored right now that this is such an opportunity in education to move towards distance and blended learning in perpetuity. I think that that is laughable. It ignores the fact that for so many of our kids, our school is the safe place. It's a safe haven. It's where they can come for nine hours a day and know they're just going to be loved. They're just going to be accepted. I get worked up about this because the idea of not seeing our kids for months and months, I can protect them when they're here. I can guard them. I can look for bruises. I can see whether or not they're selling today. I can't do that when I'm across a computer from them. Zaire is fortunate. He's able to continue classes online. I'm going to get ready to be led by Zaire in our physical exercise routine. Even leading his PE class in the morning workout. Put your right arm behind you and push, your, push it with your left arm. Before coronavirus, Ember Charter School was touted as a success. In 2019, the eighth graders here outperformed New York City, New York State and the district, the latter by more than 260 percent in reading and 540 percent in math. Now emptied out, this building and classrooms weren't just where the students came to learn math and science, but to be fed socially, emotionally, and literally to get food. You know, the vast majority of our students are low income. Over 90% qualify for free or reduced price lunch. Significant portion of our population is also housing insecure, homeless, and in shelters. And so we're not just talking about people who don't have enough money for the bills. They don't have enough to eat. Um, those are the students that we serve here. Missed meals, just one small portion of the collateral damage of COVID-19. The tentacles of this virus are not only endangering the well-being of the students, but of the school itself. We depend on our enrollment. Without our enrollment, we don't have the resources. We don't, we don't get philanthropy. You know, I know people think charter schools raise a lot of private money. We don't. Uh, you look at black and brown charter schools, we don't get any money. And so for us, really being able to attract and serve our students and our population, that's how we're able to serve everyone. And so if we can't do that, it's going to be really difficult for us to continue to hire social workers, art teachers, counselors, the folks that we need to really pull off our model. Without the necessary door knocking for the upcoming school year due to the lockdown still in place here, enrollment is down as much as 30 percent. And Rafiq says that 30 percent decrease in students could amount to a four million dollar decrease in state funding for Ember Charter School. For each student that we enroll and that stays with us, we get funding from the state. That's our per pupil. Without that, we can't grow. We can't have our population continue. It's currently a K-8 school that had plans to expand through high school this fall. Plans that are now in jeopardy. So we hope right now our proposal to expand the high schools before the Board of Regents at the State Education Department next month in early June, they'll vote. We hope that they will see that our success is worthy of expanding. Zaire's mom was counting on it. Back in January, she spoke at our public hearing about our expansion to high school, which we've been working on now for a few years. And she spoke very passionately about the need for Zaire to really be able to continue his education with us, to continue his development into the wonderful young black man that he is. And it really mattered to her that that happened. Zaire offered this quote to his graduating classmates. Do what you want, excel in everything, be yourself. 
how important uh, was education for your mother and making sure that you got the best education possible? Um, education was very important for my mother and she told me that having an education will get you farther in life. It's been said legacy is about planting seeds in a garden you never get to see. Yeah, let's make it deeper. But the hope here is that at least one seed takes root and flourishes either because of or despite the environment. And we're joined now by Democratic Congressman Hakeem Jeffries of New York, who represents a district hit hard by COVID-19. Congressman Jeffries, thanks so much for joining us. Good to be with you. So we're reporting on COVID-19 along racial and economic lines. bed -Stuy in your district has certainly been particularly devastated, ravaged by COVID-19. Give us a sense of what you've seen as far as how this virus is impacting low-income and minority communities. Well, there's a lot of pain, there's a lot of suffering, there's a lot of death all throughout America, but particularly in low-income communities of color for a variety of different reasons. We are overrepresented. Uh, in the number of frontline essential workers, people who are waking up each and every day, going to work, battling against the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, but as a result, putting themselves, their families, and their neighbors at risk. Uh, we also tend to live in denser circumstances here in Brooklyn and throughout other parts of New York City, uh, which increases the likelihood of possible infection. Uh, and then, of course, uh, we live in communities that have historically been under-resourced. And as a result of that, uh, you have people who have disproportionately higher rates of pre-existing conditions uh, like diabetes or heart disease or respiratory illness that could create additional complications in connection with the coronavirus. Yeah, my, colleague, my colleague Juju Chang spoke today with uh, Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who said, quote, poverty and inequality in and of itself is a pre-existing condition. So how much of what we're seeing as far as the impact of COVID-19 is due to these systemic disparities? And what can Congress actually do about it right now that, that might be able to get bipartisan support? I mean, part of what you're talking about is denser living conditions and uh, pre-existing conditions. What impact can Congress have on that? Well, we need to continue to provide direct intervention in terms of an infusion of resources to the American people, uh, particularly those communities that have been hit the hardest. We need another round of direct stimulus payments to everyday Americans. We have done that in terms of the HEROES Act, which has passed the House of Representatives. We need to bolster and continue to strengthen the unemployment insurance system. Here in New York State and across the country, we have done that as well in connection with the HEROES Act. We also need to make sure that we support our state and local governments uh, because to the extent there are dramatic budget cuts in New York State, in New York City, in other parts of the country, we know that it will be low-income communities of color who get hit the hardest in terms of public health or public housing or public transportation or public education. So this is an all hands on deck moment. We need the federal government to step up. Mitch McConnell has indicated that he sees no urgency in acting immediately. That is an egregious and outrageous statement. The pain, the suffering, the death demand that we act with the fierce urgency of now. I want to play something that we heard in your district from someone who lost their niece to COVID-19. Take a listen. When it's election time, they drive around in their cars saying, come out and vote. I need some cars to drive past and say, come out to this address on these days and get tested. Come out to this location and um, pick up free masks. She and others, when we were on the ground in Brooklyn, they talked about how difficult it was to get a test in bed -Stuy, how many people are afraid to go to the hospitals there. Is enough being done as far as outreach to minority communities to get them the resources that they need, including for young people shut out of schools right now, where many of them actually went to get their daily meals? Well, more certainly uh, must be done. Thankfully, uh, the New York City Department of Education does continue to provide meals uh, to children uh, throughout the city of New York who otherwise would go hungry. 
Uh, we work closely with a great organization called bed Campaign Against Hunger, which has delivered uh, meals uh, and food to thousands of people in Bedford-Stuyvesant and throughout central Brooklyn. Uh, we are also working with Governor Cuomo uh, and a variety of different houses of worship uh, in Bedford-Stuyvesant and throughout the city of New York uh, to establish neighborhood-based testing sites. Uh, in Bedford-Stuyvesant, where I was at last week, uh, the Bethany Baptist Church is one such testing site, uh, and there are many throughout the city of New York, and we're planning on scaling that up, understanding uh, that not everyone will want to go to a hospital or to a medical clinic, uh, and so we want to bring the testing to the community. Uh, that's being done, and we're going to continue to ramp that up as we move forward. Congressman Jeffries, we appreciate your time. Thanks for joining us. We're joined now by a key member of the Trump administration, Secretary Ben Carson, a member of the Coronavirus Task Force and head of the Department of Housing and Urban Development, also known as HUD. And he is also a medical doctor. Thanks so much for your time. Pleasure. Secretary Carson, the coronavirus has created a troubling racial divide, as you know. And while we don't have national data on deaths by race, we do know that in Chicago, for example, blacks are three times more likely to die from the virus than whites. In New York City, blacks and Latinos are two times more likely to die. Is the administration doing enough to address this disparity? Well, you know, this uh, crisis has really shined the light on this disparity issue. But you have to look at the layer beneath. Why is it that in Hispanic and African-American communities, you have higher incidence of that? And I think, you know, you have to look at the housing situation, the, the crowding, the inability to have appropriate distancing. You have to look at the nutritional issues, which tend to be really substantial, the medical issues in terms of appropriate follow-up, transportation, child care. There's a whole host of things that have to be fixed. You have to approach it in a holistic manner. And how do you do that? I mean, for example, just today, New York governors mentioned exactly what you're saying, saying that the new coronavirus hospitalizations and deaths mostly originate in minority and low-income neighborhoods. He raised that specific issue of how public housing residents are expected to socially distance in a tight space. So how is your department addressing this issue? And are there any solutions? Uh, yes, there are solutions. And this is probably our chance to really take care of it, because through the CARES Act, uh, a significant amount of money has been allocated. So working between federal, state, and local agencies, we will be able to do this. We'll be able to use federal lands, for instance, uh, to do some building and take advantage of some of the tremendous innovation and entrepreneurial spirit that exists in this country. It means we have to do something about the regulations. I've been talking to a lot of governors and mayors and various uh, officials around the country about those barriers that prevent us from building affordable housing. We're going to be able to get that done. We're looking at new ways to, to utilize the federal housing funding with mobile vouchers so that people have more choices so that they can move around. President Trump has, of course, directed a White House counsel to address economic disparities in African-American communities. Senator Tim Scott is heading that up. And the senator has said that he and your staff have been trading ideas for an upcoming presentation. Any basic ideas that you can share with us as far as possibilities of at least what you might be exploring? Well, for one thing, uh, you know, we, we want to have a, a national urban renewal program, and we really want to concentrate on the nonprofits. You know, we're looking at uh, the public housing tenant empowerment demonstration, and then thinking about things like how we've changed because people have learned about teleworking. And I don't think you will ever have the same number of people uh, jamming these offices around the country. It's going to change. Because you are a medical doctor, I'd be interested to get your opinion weighing in on President Trump, of course, saying this week that he's taking the malaria drug, hydroxychloroquine, as a preventative measure against COVID-19, despite the drug's potential dangers. He even suggested that there's nothing to lose. Do you agree with the president on that? And, and also, do you think that he should wear a mask, which is something that experts agree would be helpful? Well, remember that... Um, you know, hydrochloroquine has been used for 60 years uh, for malaria. 
Uh, more recently, it's been used for lupus and auto-inflammatory conditions and has a very long safety record. But it has to be used in conjunction with a healthcare provider who can determine whether you have any contraindications for the use of the medications. So you so think again, it's a good idea? Uh, I think if, if you're at uh, risk of transmission, uh, like medical workers and people who come in contact with a lot of people, it is not a bad idea if your physician feels that way, knowing your medical history. That's a very important part of it. You can't just do it. And what about wearing a mask? Is that something that you wear? And also, is it something that you think that the president should? Uh, I wear it uh, when I cannot uh, appropriately social distance. And I think everybody should do that. All right, Dr. Carson, thank you. Glad to have you on the show. Earlier this month, we took you to an often neglected corner of America, now experiencing the highest rate of deadly infection per capita in the country. And now we return to the Navajo Nation for an update on how the community is grappling with the virus. With rampant poverty and lack of infrastructure, fighting COVID has been an immense challenge. It's also been the site of another heartbreaking family tragedy. Our Matt Gutman brings us their story. Before COVID ripped apart her family of 11, Dorothy Scott had lived in this traditional Navajo hut. She shuffled toward it, but couldn't bear to go inside. What goes through your mind when you're standing at your son's grave and you hear that your husband has just passed away, all from COVID? Yeah, and then I said, what's going on? I said, and I was talking to my son right here at his grave and I got a call and I just stand there. I couldn't move or I said, what's going on? It's my husband. I know he was okay when I left. He was, he's the one that telling me to, to go, it's go the to funeral. the funeral. Yeah, and then say he's going to be here. He didn't say he was going to leave. In all, eight family members tested positive. Dorothy and several others were hospitalized. And then her son, Bobby Jr., died. Then her husband, Bobby Sr., died on May 8th. We accompanied them on their first time back home. The puppies yapped, the grandkids gleefully playing on that rope swing. But for Dorothy, the place felt haunted. And now we're at the hook on, but he's looking at it sad. What happened in there? You lost everything. Yeah. Look like my husband's still in there. His spirit, she meant. They'd been married nearly 45 years. As it is for so many, their traditional Navajo hogan had no water or electricity. They slept heaped on those couches, and Dorothy's daughter, Darcy, went inside, trying to salvage something. There wasn't much to take. The infection rate here in the Navajo Nation is higher than in New York, in the area's biggest hospital at capacity for weeks now. From what we're hearing, this could be called the epicenter of COVID in the country right now. Yes, um, you're totally right. We currently have a higher rate per capita than any state in the United States. And those not sick enough for the hospital are sent to four motels converted into respiratory clinics here in Gallup, New Mexico. And when those filled up, a gym was converted into a clinic. Good morning, my dear. How are you? Here with Kara again. Dr. Eileen Ulku has been treating the Scots at this motel for nearly two weeks. How have you been feeling? Uh, I feel good. Okay. Keeping them on oxygen and keeping them in a motel um, closed up in a room, I, I would never have believed it, but these are the kinds of things that we're doing to try to keep as many people safe and healing and getting better as possible. But there are many families like the Scots here. And we do have multi-generational homes here, um, but you have that throughout the world. Um, there are several benefits for that. Uh, it provides social support for the families. One of the biggest benefits, I think, in addition to that, is passing down the cultural knowledge you have. One of the things that we've seen is in some ways, the, the Navajo culture and what makes it strong is working against it. These big families living in the same hogan, the same house, it's getting a lot of people infected. Yes. Have you seen a lot of that? 
yeah, we actually have identified pockets. Our public health nurses have been out and about in the community and they're literally able to track, you know, where you have one contact that's positive, you literally can almost guarantee the whole household is infected as well too. A reality exacerbated by poverty and a critical lack of infrastructure. The Navajo Nation is larger than West Virginia, but 40% of the people who live here don't have electricity and 30% don't have access to running water, which is why they need to pump water at wells like this. So in the meantime, families like the Scots stay confined in those motel rooms. When we first met them a day earlier, Dorothy's daughter Darcy had been separated from some of her four boys for almost a week. Especially not seeing them and like I'm really close and with my mom and I'm always with her and especially we're going through this and we you know we have nobody to talk to and you know it gets really lonely. And do you feel like you can't show the loneliness because of yeah. the kids and how hard? How and during that brief visit, they got to hold each other again because right now it's all they have. So much more meaning in a hug these days. And our Matt Gutman joins us now. Matt, so disheartening to see things get worse since the last time that you were there. After meeting with people of the Navajo Nation, do you get the sense that things may ultimately improve, not just in the fight against COVID, but with the problems of daily life that you mentioned that existed well before the pandemic? It's been centuries of neglect. Uh, the U.S. government hasn't always been the best to the Navajo Nation. There have been uh, many broken promises and treaties, according to the Navajo. Uh, right now, they are working on trying to get that CARES money in and uh, apply to all sorts of infrastructure projects, which could help with sanitation and water and power. But people also need help right now. So the question is, in the Navajo Nation, who gets the money? How does it get allocated? And uh, who needs the help? the most right now. Lindsay. All right, Matt Gutman, thanks so much for your reporting. And when we come back, what do summer vacations look like during a pandemic? We travel to Greece to see the extraordinary steps being taken there to keep its citizens and tourists safe. Will it work? And what are others doing? The plaintiff in the landmark Roe v. Wade case later declared herself pro-life, but tonight the stunning deathbed confession who she says paid her to change her stance. But when we return the flooding emergency in the middle of a pandemic, how do you social distance and shelter with other evacuees? We'll be right back. The most powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline. Your mom said, comb your hair. Your dad told you, smarten up. Your dog is judging you right now. And your best friend just called you crazy. We all need someone who'll pull no punches and give it to us straight. Now imagine getting your news like that. No bull, no spin. Just give it to me straight. Straightforward news straight to the heart of the story. ABC News, straightforward. The Americans here on the ground and the Iraqis. 18,000 tons. Matata. Ismail. Yes. David. David. Over ground zero from Hurricane Michael. You can see just home after home. David, thanks for meeting us. This was your view. My favorite view. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, sunshine. Good morning, sunshine. Right now, how do you make sense of it all? Now, afternoons on ABC, one place with the good information you need. We are all in this together, and we're going to get through this together. Pandemic, what you need to know. Afternoons at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. 
Welcome back. We are following developments in Michigan tonight after heavy rain in the region caused river levels to rise, leading to what's being described as the catastrophic failure of two dams. And there's now growing fear that more could fail. The rising floodwaters inundated the area of Midland today with houses seen floating along in the water. Thousands have been forced from their homes, an effort made that much more difficult due to the pandemic. Our Rob Marciano is there with the latest. Tonight, horrifying images in the middle of a pandemic. Oh my God, that's somebody's house. Homes in central Michigan floating away. The National Weather Service warning residents to get to higher ground. Two catastrophic dam collapses in just hours. We advise that we have a dam breach at Edenville. This is the moment the Edenville Dam disintegrated outside Midland, Michigan, following days of rain. Downstream, the Sanford Dam breaching less than two hours later. The dam has failed. 100 percent failure. Evacuate. 10,000 residents forced to flee. Could it get worse? Yes. A nearby Dow chemical plant forced to evacuate, too. Officials say floodwaters are mixing with containment ponds. The nuclear reactor on site already shut down as a coronavirus protocol. Federal regulators had reportedly worried about a possible failure at the Edenville Dam for years. Regarding the dams, the state of Michigan is reviewing every potential uh, legal recourse that we have. Complicating matters, Michigan remains under a stay-at-home order to prevent the spread of the coronavirus. Officials say hundreds are in shelters. Another 40 or 50 stayed in their cars, and the reason largely was uh, the concerns about the COVID-19 virus. On top of this 100-year event, we have a 500 year event in a flood that has absolutely devastated uh, a lot of families. Joins us now from central Michigan where there is great concern as we just heard that more dams could fail tonight. What's the latest and how do things look for the hours and days ahead? And let me guess that you are standing in the middle of what's normally a road. That's absolutely true, Lindsay. Matter of fact, th this river has never been this high. Uh, it's cresting now, but they are concerned that one of those dams upstream may fail further. So that's going to be a, an issue going overnight uh, tonight. But you can see the water here going into, that's a new hotel. It's pouring into the first level there, the county courthouse first level as well. And this is dangerously close to the beautiful Main Street here in Midland, which like so many towns across America has already taken an economic hit with this virus shutdown. Thankfully, we had some sunshine today. Day, but the entire system is slid to the south and it's going very slowly. So Ohio, uh, Kentucky, the Mid-Atlantic, you're going to get rainfall over the next couple of days. It could be over five inches. And I think especially the Carolinas could see uh, some flooding into Friday or even Saturday. Here, this river, like I said, it's rising. Hopefully it stays that way and goes down a little bit more tonight. Uh, but it's going to remain at record levels right into the weekend, Lindsay. At least there's some sunshine at the moment. Rob, thanks so much. Still a lot more to report out here on ABC News Prime. Signs of hope in the fight against COVID-19. What we're now learning about immunity against the virus. The study shows how soon our bodies may develop antibodies. And many who work in the tourism industry have had their livelihoods uprooted. A look at how bad it's been with the busy summer travel season set to begin. But first, our tweet of the day. The head of the FDA celebrating getting out of quarantine. In times like these, the news-making events happen here. ABC News. President Trump meeting face-to-face -face with one of the world's most brutal dictators, Kim Jong-un. The president. You trust him. I do trust him, yeah. I think he trusts me, and I trust him. Ivanka Trump. I have to ask you about your emails. Your father had taken Hillary Clinton to task for this. There just is no equivalency. So the idea of lock her up doesn't apply to you? No. <laughs> Comey. How strange is it for you to sit here and compare the president to a mob boss? Very strange. Michelle Obama. What do you wish you could tell your pre-White House self? Whew. Melania Trump. Do you think there's still people there that he can't trust? Yes. Still working now? Yes. Michael Cohen. So he's still lying? Yes. It's a big statement. And now, in a year with so much on the line, we're right there. Good evening tonight from Washington, a very busy news night. America's number one news source, ABC News, straightforward. We all need someone who'll pull no punches and give it to us straight. No bull, no spin. Now, imagine getting your news like that. Just give it to me straight. ABC News, straightforward.
Another week in America, a country facing a new test now. The Wuhan airport, almost no one here. The last flight out of Rome. This is the nursing home just outside Seattle. Dozens of people were just rushed off this cruise ship. This is ground zero. It is shut down. Another ambulance just pulled out. Now they're headed to the hospital. Time is of the essence. You can see the ship behind me. This is the first time tests have been done here. Morning, afternoon, evening, late night. 24-7 ABC News, there for you. What's the most innovative daily news podcast out there to listen to every day? Well, the Edward R. Murrow Awards say it's Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. Even the New York Times calls us a top news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, free on Apple Podcasts. Welcome back, everyone. We turn tonight to travel and tourism during this pandemic. It's an industry now in crisis worldwide and here in the U.S. We look at what's been lost by the numbers. More than half of the 15.8 million travel and tourism related jobs in the U.S. have disappeared since the COVID-19 outbreak, according to the U.S. Travel Association. That's left 51% of American travel industry workers unemployed. To put that all in perspective, that's twice the unemployment rate of all workers during the Great Depression when unemployment was at 25%. Popular vacation destinations are certainly hard hit. In Hawaii, tourism spending is down 96% compared to last year. Travel spending in Florida is down 88% and down 95% in Puerto Rico since last year. In typical times, Americans take on average four vacations a year, according to the U.S. Travel Association. But this year, many are cutting back. And still ahead here on ABC News Prime, how is tourist-reliant Hawaii striking the balance between protecting lives and livelihoods? We speak with the governor. And the new FX documentary, Changing What We Knew About the woman at the center of the landmark Roe v. Wade case. But first, here are some of the trending headlines on ABCnews.com. What you're seeing right now, this is part of the eye wall. This procession of migrants goes back two miles. There is going to be catastrophic damage. This fire has made a run. You can see those flames shooting up into the sky. We are on the jam-packed red carpet. Let's do it right, guys. So this is the fourth week end of protest. Watch NBC News on location for Facebook Watch. What's the most innovative daily news podcast out there to listen to every day? Well, the Edward R. Murrow Awards say it's Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. Even the New York Times calls us a top news podcast worth listening to. So if you like getting behind the biggest news stories of the day, inside all the details, the backstory, and what will happen next, then listen to Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. It's like no other news podcast out there. Even the critics agree. Listen free on Apple Podcasts. This is what being live is all about. This is ABC News Live, the 24-7 streaming news source from ABC News. Breaking news, live events, streaming nonstop. Original breakthrough storytelling from ABC News, National Geographic, ESPN. And it's all designed differently for you to stream straight to any screen whenever you want. ABC News Live. Streaming everywhere right to you. ABC News Live. It's that easy to go there. The Americans here on the ground and the Iraqis. 18,000 tons. Matatas. Ismail? David. David. Over ground zero from Hurricane Michael. You can see just home after home. David, thanks for meeting us. This was your view. My favorite view. Thank you very much. Thank you. Democrats pushing for the Senate to consider a new multi-trillion dollar economic relief bill passed by the House last week. The HEROES Act would provide funding for state and local governments. By enabling them to keep their jobs to help save lives, I think public opinion uh, will be uh, very much our friend in all of this. But the White House has threatened to veto the bill, and Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell has declined to take it up. The Speaker's proposal was so unserious and so far left, it could not even unite her own conference. This as the nation pushes ahead with plans to reopen. All 50 states now easy some form of social distancing restrictions after Connecticut did so today. Please evacuate to a safe area. 
Thousands of residents in Midland, Michigan, already dealing with coronavirus shutdowns, are now forced out of their homes due to major flooding. High waters triggered by dam breaches. The water isn't expected to crest until tonight. President Trump now deploying FEMA to the area. Governor Gretchen Whitmer declaring a state of emergency, even lifting stay-at-home orders to speed up the evacuation process. Experts are describing this as a 500-year event. In Mexico City, the death toll from COVID-19 might be three times higher than the 1,300 that have been reported. Doctors say they're not just fighting the virus, they're fighting skepticism that the virus even exists. Brazil is now the epicenter of the outbreak in Latin America, a quarter million cases there so far. Brazil, finding itself the epicenter of the global pandemic in Latin America. Its death toll nearing 18,000. The number of cases soaring beyond a quarter of a million, making it now the third worst hit nation on the planet, only behind the U.S. and Russia. Brazil's president continues to downplay the deadly virus, saying people are dying, but more will die if the economy continues to be destroyed by those measures. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo is going on record about the latest firing of an inspector general as reports emerge that Pompeo was a subject of at least one inquiry. Pompeo confirmed Wednesday that he suggested to President Trump that the State Department's inspector general be fired. In this case, I recommend it to the president that Steve Linick be terminated. Frankly, should have done it some time ago. The secretary didn't offer rationale, but pushed back on congressional Democrats' allegation that the move was retaliatory, saying he had no knowledge of any ongoing investigation. And welcome back. A shocking confession. Norma McCorvey, a.k.a. Jane Roe, the plaintiff in the landmark Roe v. Wade case, says her anti-abortion advocacy was all a lie. McCorvey stunned the world when she came out against abortion in 1995. But now, in a new documentary filmed months before her death, she says she only did that because she was paid by anti-abortion groups. Did they use you as a trophy? Of course. I was the big fish. Well, I think it was a mutual thing. You know, I took their money and they put me out in front of the cameras and told me what to say. The Norma McCorvey we see in this documentary paints an entirely different picture of the woman who tirelessly worked to overturn the law that bore her name. She calls it a deathbed confession, and as we see in this clip, shows remarkable sympathy for women facing this difficult choice. I know how I felt when I found out that I was pregnant. And I wasn't going to let another woman feel that way. Not cheap, dirty, and no good. Women make mistakes. And they make mistakes with men. And things happen. So it's just, it's just Mother Nature at work, you know. And um, you, can't, you can't stop it. You can't explain it. It's just something that happens. The documentary, AKA Jane Rowe, premieres this Friday on FX. Some encouraging news to the scientific question Does this virus produce antibodies? A study of hospitalized patients found nearly all with the virus had immunity. Emory University researchers found a specific virus neutralizing antibody in patients within six days of testing positive for COVID-19. By finding that key antibody, scientists say it will help them create a better test and vaccine. One unknown, how long does protection last? Some of the biggest casualties from this pandemic are places that rely on tourism to keep their economies going. Places like Greece, for instance. ABC's James Longman is in Greece tonight with a look at how that country has been so successful in fighting the virus and the steps they're taking to keep potential visitors safe. Thousands of years of history paused by this modern pandemic. So there we are, plexiglass. Yes, this is new. plexiglass because the people, I'm sure that they're afraid. So they want to, to feel safe. Mm, mm, mm. And as I told you, our motto safety is first. safety first. Yeah. Greek officials are ready to jumpstart an ailing economy. Their culture minister took us on a tour of the Parthenon, one of the most visited sites on earth, the temple of Greek goddess Athena. I suppose it's appropriate that we're in the temple to Athena, the goddess of wisdom, and Greece had 
a wise approach to coronavirus. Is that true? Is that fair Is that to say? Yeah. But with reopening comes adjustments. Six-foot markings on the 19th century marble and a 90% drop in permitted visitors. There were many days that uh, Acropolis could be visited by almost 20,000 people. Now, for these days, in the Acropolis should be about 2,000. Wow, you're it's, going to slash the number from course, 20 to 2,000. Yeah. But still a sense of relief. It's freedom. Um, After 60 days, especially for Greek people. Greece has had extraordinary success so far in the fight against coronavirus. A population of around 11 million has seen just 165 deaths from under 3,000 cases. Not a single health worker has died. But how? Officials here point to one major strategy, screening at the airport for every single passenger coming in since March 20. You have to fill out a form and then everybody on that plane has a mouth swab. Citizens who test negative are able to go home but must quarantine for 14 days. Positive cases remain at the hotel and are given medical assistance. There are no exceptions. <laughs> Results take 24 hours. Visitors, including citizens, are transported to specially designated hotels to wait for them. But the testing is only the beginning. This is the control room of the Civil Protection Authority here in Greece. And it's basically the war room. It's where they map coronavirus, where they can see who's got it, who's come into contact with people. They know who've got it. The information is so detailed. They can zoom right down into a specific area and identify the individual who's currently in quarantine. Their early preventative measures may have spared them the worst. H how much of a difference do you think it made closing the border on the 20th of March? It's, it was very vital to close the borders. It was very vital to close the schools. It was very vital to, um, and, you know, just look down the, the country. But Greece, like other nations, is about to face its biggest challenge yet, summer tourism. They plan to reopen to international travellers by July 1st. So one of the islands, Mykonos, yes. this is a place where you didn't have very much coronavirus, yes. but I'm thousands of people are going to visit Mykonos, and at the moment you only have how many beds? Three beds. Three but coronavirus Three beds. dedicated beds for coronavirus. Right. This can be something different. So. Only three dedicated beds for coronavirus right now on a massive holiday island, but you're yep. going to have to think about how to change yes, we that. we have to restructure this. Or transfer them. Or transfer them. Barring foreigners from coming in is not something Greece can afford. Tourism accounts for 18% of the country's GDP and employs one-fifth of its workforce. We headed down to one of the most popular islands, Santorini, to see what changes are being made ahead of the now delayed tourist season. How will a vacation be different now? The difference is going to be, I think, in uh, this season, it's going to be the distance. I would guess they're going to be in our home, mm. and they're going to be like our home. And we're going to take care of them, so they must come safe and live safe. Social distancing enforced on the beaches, maybe even plexiglass partitions to separate sun loungers. But can any of this even work? It's the small bread to catch the big fish. <laughs> This is the idea of the plexiglass. I never dream our beaches to be with plexiglass, but safety, with distance, with all this, we are ready. You're going to go first. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Anthe runs a boat touring company. She'll have to reduce the number of people she's allowed to take. But today is her first day back on her boat. How does it feel to be back out on the water? Free. Free. Free, yes. So you can uh, breathe, you have the, the sea breeze over here, and uh, you don't see any at the horizon, you see an open horizon. Nothing that you have to, to worry about. I know, how was it uh, sitting here on this beautiful island, watching the world melt down? I, I felt by. lucky. <laughs> I felt really lucky on one hand. On the other hand, I was really worried about um, the people that I have already met around the world and uh, when we keep uh, texting, uh, texting each other and they tell me how bad the situation is in their areas, I wish I could bring them here. Greece has protected the health of its citizens. Now its economic well-being is on the line. After the hell of lockdown, paradise like this will be a major draw for people around the world. Opening these islands up again is a gamble, but for Anthe at least, it's one they must take. So, when will your first booking be? Do you know when? I had my first yesterday. Oh, wow! I don't know how this is. And, um, how do you feel about it? Uh, I think this 
uh, I felt like you know the combination of uh, yesterday's booking and today for with us being here on the boat again I feel like uh, it was a nightmare everything from before and now I think very positive and uh, I look forward to it <laughs> James Longman ABC News Santorini in Greece our thanks to James Longman. And, and let's now bring in the governor, David Ige of Hawaii, a, a state where the economy is, of course, driven by travel and tourism. Governor, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Lindsay. I appreciate the opportunity. So we just heard in that report that Greece has, has done relatively well containing the coronavirus and is now looking to reopen their country ahead of the summer tourism season. Your state has also been able to keep cases low as you've put in place a 14-day quarantine on anyone coming into Hawaii. So what would you need to see before your state can more fully reopen, including for tourism? You know, Lindsay, we are really focused on the health and well-being of our community at this point in time. Uh, you know, we want to ensure that we have uh, systems and processes in place that can really uh, keep our community safe. Uh, so uh, we are working with the industry to talk about um, how we can reinvent the hospitality industry in the post-COVID world, uh, recognizing that there will be infectious diseases uh, and how we can create a, a layered and structured way of screening uh, those who travel to the islands, uh, being identified those who may become sick or are ill, uh, and really pro protecting both visitors and our residents uh, from becoming infected uh, by COVID-19. So you were just talking about the screenings. In Greece, they screened all passengers at airports as they came into the country. Some officials in your state have proposed the idea of COVID testing of anyone flying into Hawaii. Is that even feasible? And will your state look to put such a policy in place? You know, that really is not uh, feasible, Lindsay, right now. You know, our entire uh, testing capacity, and we really feel that we are in a good place right now. Uh, we can test uh, more than 3,000 uh, individuals on a daily basis, and we can surge to 5,000, uh, which is more than what is necessary according to the CDC guidelines. But if we were requiring every single incoming uh, person uh, Lindsay, at the height of our success in the visitor industry, we were receiving more than 30,000 arrivals each and every day. Oh, wow. Uh, and, our, yeah, and there's no way that we could, in a practical way, test all incoming travelers. I'm just curious, when you talk about th three, what is it, 30,000 arrivals a day? Was it 30,000? How much yes. has that number dropped now um, during the pandemic? We have been successful in uh, turning away 99% of the travel to the islands. The daily arrivals are uh, between 500 and 800 per day now, uh, from the peak of more than 30,000. Oh, so a lot of people didn't actually make good on their ideas to quarantine in Hawaii. It seemed like it was uh, it would have been the, the hot spot had you not turned people away. But but on a serious note, unemployment has hit your state hard uh, during the pandemic, of course, with the drop off in tourism. Describe the scope of the impact there and how concerned you are that travel won't come back quickly and that some jobs may be lost long term. So, so uh, Lindsay, uh, on a couple of different fronts, you know, Hawaii went from uh, having the lowest unemployment rate in the country uh, to the highest unemployment rate in the country in the matter of six to eight weeks. Uh, our un unemployment rate uh, now is about one out of three individuals in the state is, uh, is currently unemployed. Uh, most of that tied to the visitor industry directly. And, and there have been arrests of visitors who have violated the state's 14-day quarantine. Uh, why was that level of enforcement necessary? And how are you trying to now strike the balance of protecting lives while also bringing back the livelihoods of those who depend on people visiting your state? Uh, you know, certainly we um, were very serious about our mandatory quarantine. And as, as you uh, may know all around the world, uh, the first um, cases of COVID-19 were tied directly to travel. Uh, so we were very serious in uh, implementing the quarantine. And yes, we did uh, arrest those who violated um, um, the quarantine order because we were committed to protecting our community uh, from increasing infections. Right now, all travel in the state of Hawaii is subject to the mandatory quarantine. 
uh, we're beginning the process to allow uh, travel between islands as a first step. Uh, and then, like, as I said, uh, working with the industry to ensure that, you know, contact tracing and identifying those uh, individuals who are sick and really being able to provide them treatment and keep them isolated is what we need to do to reopen the entire state uh, to travelers coming from around the world. Governor Ige, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for having me on. Aloha. And if you want to hear aloha, you got to, of course, get on a plane to go to Hawaii. And as America reopens, passengers are slowly starting to head to the airports. Our Gio Benita has got a glimpse from one major airline about what they're doing to keep passengers safe. Tonight, a first look at what Delta says is the future of flying. As air travel picks up, Delta bringing us on board, showing us how it hopes to reassure travelers. Before every single flight, electrostatic spraying, the disinfectant clings to surfaces to kill viruses and bacteria. Then comes a full wipe down and an inspection by the on-flight crew. When it's time to board, workers ask passengers to keep their distance with the back of the plane boarding first. We are bored from the rear of the aircraft. And not every seat will be filled. Delta tonight promising that each flight will be capped at 60% or they'll call in a bigger plane. What we have done today lays the foundation for where we're going to go in the future. Our thanks to Gio for that. And up next, the story of a very good dog who is helping a lot of people one one-sided conversation at a time. Stay with us. Now, how do you make sense of it all? Now, afternoons on ABC, one place with the good information you need. We are all in this together, and we're going to get through this together. Pandemic, what you need to know. Afternoons at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. Friday nights, 9, 8 Central. True crime, cinematic, real-life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime. 2020, Friday nights, 9, 8 Central on ABC. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. ABC News, honored. Winner of four Edward R. Murrow Awards, including the most prestigious honor, overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news choice. This is what being live is all about. This is like ABC C. News Live, the 24-7 streaming news source of ABC News. Wow. Breaking news, live events streaming non-stop original breakthrough storytelling from abc news national geographic espn and it's all designed differently for you to stream straight to any screen whenever you want abc news live streaming everywhere right to you abc news live it's that easy to go there good morning sunshine Good morning, sunshine. Good morning, sunshine. We've been waiting for you. Say, say good morning. Good morning, sunshine. In America. Say good morning. I want you to wake me up. ABC News, America's number one news source. Straightforward news. Straight to the heart of the story. ABC News. Straightforward. Finally, it turns out working from home, it's not just for humans. One golden retriever is providing therapeutic interactions online now that social distancing prevents in-person petting. The medical nonprofit the dog works for is now offering virtual sessions for anyone who needs some canine companionship. And apparently, they are a big hit. Check it out. Oh, sweet. <laughs> Meet Lainey, golden retriever You're slash crazy? therapy dog. Lainey was set to begin her first medical mission, but then the pandemic hit. Owner Amy Galacia Torres knew Lainey was needed now more than ever. So Lainey went online, providing virtual visits to anyone who needs them, like Jimmy Harris. Lainey. Lainey, see, I'm a pretty girl. Speak. Uh, she's really good at responding to anything you're saying, and she even watches you on the camera, which is cool. Harris, who's an Army National Guard vet, says these visits with Lainey are the therapy he needs during this difficult time. Just the, I think the connection with an animal 
just helps bring a calmness over the person's mind and they get to forget about whatever troubles they're having. A lot of the times, you know, patients need some sort of distraction or they're feeling a lot of pain. So Laney is a great way to distract them in person. And what we've noticed virtually, it's pretty much the same thing. A dog's love, man's best friend for a reason. And dogs have always gone and given me hope and help during difficult times. And so I wanted to be able to bring that to people. Our thanks to Laney and Pause for Patience, as well as our ABC station in Phoenix for that story. And before we go tonight, we are celebrating one of our very own associate producer, Kelly Carrion, virtually graduated with her master's degree in journalism from Columbia University today. Kelly, the proud daughter of Ecuadorian immigrants and a first-generation grad, focused on Latino youth embracing their identity through Latin urban music as her thesis. And to drive that passion home, her cap decorated as an ode to Puerto Rican artist Bad Bunny. Our hats off to you and our image of the day. And that is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us and good night.